1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20. We'll be closing out chapter 6 this week. As we continue in our series on being united as a body of believers, the universal church, all God's people in reading God's word should come to the same conclusion of Scripture. And it is inerrant. There are no mistakes. Everything in it is useful for us in some way. Not just for the young, middle-aged, the old. It's useful for all of us. Whenever you get to books like uh, Numbers, it's really easy to go, I don't want to read so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so. And it's literally like that. Lived for a hundred years and died and was the father too, etc., etc. With a little story in between, it gets difficult. And it's like, ah, it's not really useful for me. So you'd have to be able to step back and be able to see the overarching picture of why there was a census and what was going on. Likewise, when you look into chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians, you get to this particular topic of Scripture and you'll look at it in your copy of God's Word and actually most of them would say flee sexual immorality or the problems of immorality in the church. Some heading like this and go, well, you know what? It's not an issue for me. My husband went to be with the Lord or my wife went to be with the Lord or I've been a bachelor this whole time or I'm just at this age where that's not important. You're in, you know you better than anyone else. But the thing about the rest of the world is, is we don't know everything about one another. We don't know what is a struggle for one another, what we're dealing with, what monopolizes our minds, things that we need, things that we don't need from everybody else. I don't know what's going on inside my own wife's head. She definitely doesn't want to know what's going on in my head. But to assume that something is unneeded just because we don't directly deal with it, you as an individual don't deal with it, doesn't mean that somebody else isn't struggling with it. Let me just say that in the church today, as I shared a couple of weeks ago about, a, it was a young pastor who was out groping on little boys. I've known of situations where individuals were student ministers and then upon one of their one of their students had graduated high school, they immediately got married within a month. It indicates that there was already a relationship going on. There have been pastors that have left their spouses, divorced them at the drop of a hat, and then begin a relationship with someone new almost immediately who is significantly younger or older. I have uh, some dear friends that an older parent, their older parent, left the relationship with their wife of umpteen years to go pursue a relationship with someone much younger. It happens. We don't know the heart of one another, so therefore we need to come together in understanding how we as a whole should guard and protect our own hearts and the hearts of one another in dealing with this serious issue that children and teenagers are being bombarded with in schools. I told you last week that there is a book being circulated I believe it was in a Massachusetts school on, it was titled The King and King. And it was about a young prince who wanted to have a relationship with whoever he wanted to. And it turned out to be another male prince from another kingdom. And that's a school book. There's a serious I mean, I'm not that old. I was born in 1981, but I can tell a significant difference in life and culture in the world in then versus today. Stuff back then was barely whispered upon. You barely even talked about it, even as a child. It just 
was beyond us and we had no business hearing about it at the time. And now it's being bombarded in our culture. It's on our televisions, it's on our radios. Whenever we're traveling down the road, it's in country songs, it's in pop songs, it's in everything. I had an illustration that I cannot use. There was a song, uh, and I shared this with Haley a couple weeks back, or last week, or this past week. The song, Baby It's Cold Outside, it's a Christmas song, was, quote, canceled. Don't play it on the radio. Because it uh, over-personifies the male figure, the male individual. If you've read the words, you're like, I don't understand. I don't see how that's possible. But culture, don't play it anymore. The number one song in 2020, I can't even name the song. Because it's so derogatory and it's uh, an acronym for the words. But I looked up the lyrics for this. And then contrasted, maybe it's cold outside, to this. You cannot play it on the radio because literally there are probably eight words that are repeated in it that you could actually use on the radio. Yet it's the most pop, it was the most popular number one song in the world, or at least in the American charts, for months. And it is despicable because it's speaking of the female organs of an individual. And then they're saying that that's acceptable, but maybe it's cold outside. Mom and dad will worry. It's getting late, I need to go. It's unacceptable. Granted, I'm not saying advocating for that song, it's not a Christian song or anything by no means, but what is going on with our, the world's minds? What is acceptable? What is unacceptable? And you know better than me what you hear from your family, from your children, from your grandchildren. Know what your grandchildren are interacting with. Know what they're looking for. Maybe your own children are dealing with or going through. I preface all that to say that we need to be united. I pre that's the preface for this, to say that we need to be united against sexual immorality. And we need to understand the five uses of the body. I will tell you that I would say that if you know of your family coming and they're going to have children, we'll make special provisions if they feel that this is a little too much for the next few weeks. And we can make a class arrangement for littler children that may not be, that may not need to be hearing this. But that's up to you. But I offer that everything is useful out of God's Word. So as we go through this this morning, let me first give you the definition and what I feel is the biblical definition for sexuality. And specifically, what is the biblical definition of what is sexual immorality? The word, and y'all heard it used before by other preachers, is the, the word porneia, which is where we get the term pornography from. It is defined as anything outside of the marital relationship between a heterosexual male and female. That needs to be our definition as a church. That needs to be the definition of a Christian. If you are in Christ, that has to be where our position is on what God defines as sexually immoral. Anything outside of the marital relationship between a heterosexual male and female. Anything outside. Anything other than that is an affront and a sin before God for His creation. Haley and I were having an impromptu conversation at lunch this past week. And doesn't this just make for interesting lunch talk? <laughs> Having done ministry with years, and one of the very first Bible studies I did was through a book called Every Young Man's Battle. And it's on this topic and specifically designed for young men whenever I was in Beaumont. And it's crazy to hear these kids and what they, the questions that they have, the conversations that they have. At a previous church, I had two young ladies walk up to me, and that was uncomfortable to begin with. And thankfully we were outside, and it was right before church service, and they just thought that this was 
the conversation, I had no female workers and no ladies that I could just be like, hey, I know they're going to give you this best response and we're out in public. People are walking around. I'm like, okay, I'm comfortable enough to say this. And I gave them this answer, but their question was, why is it so important to wait till marriage to have sex? And I had that conversation with them and gave them this definition as well. But teens are asking, and young adults are even asking, what is considered out of bounds? Well, it goes back to the same exact answer. Anything outside of the marital relationship between a heterosexual male and woman, a male and female, man and a woman, anything outside of that marriage relationship, One thing that happens is we cannot enjoy God's abundant life if there is sexual morality in our lives. Now, that is not just a specific explanation for sexual morality. That is all sin. If we have a sin struggle, and it may not even be sensuality, and it's a struggle in our lives, we will not enjoy God's abundant life and what he has in store for us when we are struggling through these sin problems. It won't happen. But one thing that was going on in Corinth is that these individuals, and you'll read it here in just a second, is they wholeheartedly believed that they had their freedom in Christ. That's 100% true. That is biblical, to have freedom in Christ. But what they would say is, is everything is permissible because of their freedom. And we'll see that. That is not correct. The, this idea, everything is permissible, is the catchphrase of Corinth. This was inscribed on their walls. This is what they believed was okay. This was not a Christian thought. This did not come out of the church of Corinth. This is a Corinth, the city, the people. This is their idea of a catchphrase. That's a catchy catchphrase. Everything's permissible. permissible do what you want. Whenever I went through Ephesians and I had talked to you about how the city was arranged, you had the library on one side where they would go and all the intellectuals would gather, but then directly across the street, you'd have little markers on the ground that symbolized a foot, a woman's foot on one side, a man's foot on the other, so that you know which side of the prostitution house to go into. This was definitely present in Corinth. Do you not think that we are telling people where they should go in the world? Schools, parents even, are telling their children, if you want to do this, you can do that. Go ahead. It's okay. It's acceptable. Everything is permissible. Schools are telling this to children and to parents. If you haven't watched the news, school boards are being bombarded with parents, and they are angry. The people believed I am free to do whatever I want. Their practice was that the, the soul and the spirit don't matter to the flesh. That is separate. That's for God. Our soul and our spirit, that's for God. But our bodies, we're here. But let's look and understand what their idea or frame of mind was in life. But before that, let me pray. How about that? God, we love you and thank you for bringing us here. And God, give me strength and courage to be truthful and honest with your word and to present it raw and untouched for these sweet, dear saints. God, let it not fall on deaf ears, but to bring it into our minds and absorb it so that we have an understanding of how we as Christians ought to view marriage, life, and what we do with our bodies and the words of our mouths and the cries of our hearts for the things that you have created for usefulness to you. God bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 12. It says this, All things are lawful for me, 
but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Do not be dominated by anything. That's the big issue in culture is any sin can be debilitating and dominating in our person. It can take control of our lives, and that's the only thing that we think about or want or desire. Why do you think that we have rapes and assaults in the world? It's because an individual has been dominated by that sexual desire and cannot get it under control. Maybe he doesn't communicate it. And we'll, we'll see here in a minute the problems of not controlling it or dealing with it. But this exclaims everything is lawful, but everything is, uh, uh, is not of benefit. It shouldn't dominate us, especially this. There are absolutely free people from the penalty of sin in Christ. This is 100% biblical. As Christians, we are freed from sin's destruction eternally. But we are not freed from the consequences we make on this earth. We live life. There are consequences to every bit of our actions. I have a brother who, I only have one brother, but my brother has uh, been serving, and I've shared this with y'all before, and he knows this, and he's proclaimed this. He's come to terms with the sinfulness of his life and what he has done. But he had a relationship with someone that he had no business having a relationship with. He is now serving a sentence in prison because of a choice of a dominating sin struggle in his life. It wasn't that he was, to coin the term of culture, a pervert and someone wishing to just have a relationship specifically with a teenager. It's because there was a sin struggle of sex. That's the issue. That's the issue with a lot of people. Two things you don't mess with in culture, sex and money. Don't touch my sex and don't touch my money. That's culture. What do you think the biggest arguments in families are? You, you're... Y'all are much more seasoned than I. Almost said the O word. Don't want to get in trouble. What? Older. Don't want to say older. <laughs> but you can think in your mind's eye, look back, what were the biggest conversations? Money and sex. That was the biggest conversations. Maybe the children as well. <laughs> But you deal with the consequences of our actions. And my brother is dealing with those consequences of our actions. And these individuals back then believed that everything was permissible. I can do whatever I want. Well, you don't understand the consequences that you are putting on yourself by doing these things. But they believed, I'm free, it's okay. But here's a helpful, helpful tip for believers. But you won't like it. And maybe one of you will... Practice this, hopefully it's not, but when you find yourself asking the question, can I be a Christian? Simply ask yourself, like, can I be a Christian and do this? Ask yourself this, can I fully honor God by doing X, whatever that is? Will I benefit the kingdom by doing X, whatever that is? And this is not specifically of sexuality, but anything. Can I lead others to Christ effectively if I do this? We need to be asking ourselves that daily. Does this thing, whatever this is that I want to do, that I ask the question, can I be a Christian and do this? Does that bring glory to God? Verse 13 through 14 and 19 and 20 our examples meant to get people and us to use our bodies for what they are meant for and how special they are made and what special nature they are made for. But look at verse 13. And I promise I'll get you out of here on time. Don't fall asleep just yet. But verse 13. Food is meant for, for the stomach and the stomach for food. Well, that kind of makes sense. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The world does not want to hear this. Christians sometimes don't really care to just continually walk in this. You 
are not made for this world. God did not create you just to have this world. You were created to have a relationship with God. Right? Did I go to the 13 yet? Mm -hmm. I think I did. Only be joined to Christ and your spouse. That is correct. I have my notes backwards. Verse 13 is an argument in Corinth where the food is for the body just as sexual morality is for the body. Well, I have a stomach. I need to feed it. I'm a male. I need to feed it. I'm a woman. I need to feed it. I have all these things. I am built this way for a reason. This is how I need to live my life. It's okay. It's acceptable. I eat, right? That is very bad reasoning. Food for the body, sex for the body, that's, that's not it. Sexuality is not just a natural act of the body like eating food. It's not. They were only thinking of the physical and not the spiritual. That screams a modern day mentality whenever we start to think that way. I'm built this way. I'm a man or you're a woman. That's just how it is. You prior, we prioritize, human beings prioritize things incorrectly. My body, my choice, overindulgence. Right? That's a big, that's a big conversation that there are people in the church that deal with that. It's my body, my choice. Not if you read Scripture. And we'll understand here in just a minute. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. Anything outside of the marital relationship between a heterosexual man and a woman. I heard a man say this. Someone had told him in regard to eating that you should treat your body well and you should invest your body. His response was, I am proud to say that I have doubled my investment. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that. But see, that's the mentality that people have. It's just I can do whatever I want with my body. I can eat 20 gallons of Bluebell and not suffer the consequences of it. I can do whatever I want with it and, yeah. God gave me bones in my knuckles for frogging kids. Does that mean I should be allowed to do it anytime I want? I'm waiting for their answer. Verse 14. And God raised the Lord and will raise up us by His power. Paul exclaims that the need for food and food for the body will be destroyed. It's going to go away. But the body is destined for resurrection and renewal through Christ. And if we mistreat it now, do you not think that there are circumstances or consequences for our decisions? I know you're seeing this only be judged, only be joined to Christ and your spouse, but verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Becoming one with another in sex is a marital, is only viewed properly in a marital context. Marriage. That's it. Bear with me on this because I know this is going to possibly dredge up further conversations or frustrations later or bring to mind some things, but listen to this. We take this word prostitute and we automatically assume that's what culture has developed it as. A transactional relationship with the opposite sex. But if you read Judges and you read the Old Testament, God constantly ask the question of them, why do you prostitute yourself to these other gods? 
Well, that's kind of a weird statement. The, the, other, the gods that they worshipped were statues, little wooden idols, things that they could move around and transport. Now, how do you prostitute yourself with that? It's a transactional relationship. And this is the closest word we can get to in English, from Greek into English. This transactional relationship between a man and a woman. But where God uses it to the whole people, why do you have this transactional relationship with other gods, other beliefs? You give me something, I will give you this. I will praise you, you make my crops grow. Let me have good uh, quality livestock this year. Dagon, going to these other gods, the gods of Babylonia, all these other little, little G gods, these fake imitation, not real, absolutely nothing real about them. And they are surrendering themselves over to them. With the idea that, oh, I'm going to worship this God, and then I will have a good rain year, I'll have good crops, I'll have good income this year, everything will be great, wonderful, and woohoo! That's transactional. Here's the question Is that a precept of God? Is that something that God had instituted? Do something for me, and I will do something for you. Has God ever, in. Your idea, your thoughts of reading scripture, has God ever said, if you do this, I will do that, insofar as doing something immoral? No, because that's a worldly thing. Transactional relationships are a worldly idea. Transactional relationships, and here's where it is, bear with me, in marriage is immoral, unbiblical, and ungodly. We'll get more into this in the chapter 7. But to have the idea, if you do something good for me, I will do this for you. Example, in marriage, if you clean the house, do the chores, if you make me feel comfortable, if you make me happy, if you do all these things to make me feel good, I'll give you sex. That is not how marriage works. And again, in chapter 7, we'll talk more to that. But we say we're joined to our spouse, joined to Christ and then joined to our spouse. If it's transactional, you're not joined. It's an agreement. It's become a contract. But this word, again, we'll move on from there. But again, we'll speak to that in chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. Marriage should have nothing to do with transactional relationships. It should never be, you do this, I do that. That is opening up opportunity for Satan and his demons to influence your marriage, your relationships, your friends, and that goes for everyone that you know and how they view marriage. If someone comes up to you and says, I'm having this issue in marriage, this is a good place to start in having that conversation about, let's talk about what your relationship is like. Look on in verse 16. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. Paul brings this out in verse 16 by bringing this right back to the origin of marital relationship. The joining together, being one flesh, not two people existing with one another working things out. It is, it is not like that. And it's not just in sexuality. It's in a relationship, in a communication. I, I guarantee I could take a poll. How many of you husbands and wives, whenever you've been going through the day and whatever is going on in a relationship with your spouse, and you had the same thoughts? I think we need to do this. Has anyone ever, has that happened to anybody? Are Haley and I the only weird ones that we can, yeah. That is just like, I was just thinking that we need to go do this. Oops, broke it again. And Haley and I would just sit there and stare at each other just like, we got this figured out. It has nothing to, that joining of one flesh is the act that connects. But spiritually something happens to a man and woman when they're married. I've seen so many stories of a husband and wife who pass on 
not too far apart from one another. And I can guarantee you go look at their relationship and look at their characters and look at how they interacted with one another and you'll understand why. They were so joined together spiritually that God, God knew that I, they can't last without the other. Haley took out an extra high life insurance policy, so I'm sure she's not counting on me and her passing at the same time. I'm kidding. I love you. And it's not to say that people that aren't connected, that have passed on before, don't get me wrong and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Somebody that has passed on and moved on well before, it just means that God's not done with you and he has equipped you for something special and something great. Don't think for a second you were unworthy. That's not it. God is not done with you. That's the only reason why whenever we're not, we come out of those baptismal waters that we are not yanked up to heaven immediately because God has something for you, for you, for you, for you, for everybody to do. Verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. You know, I was in the closet this past week uh, working over there. Some ladies needed to come over and get some clothes. And I was looking at this verse and I was thinking through this. Christ, when we, when we profess Christ as our Lord and Savior and he comes into our lives and dwells within us. And we are joined to that spirit. And then going back to uh, this idea of joining and being joined together and being in one spirit. And it goes right back to the conversation that you had in previous uh, verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? We are joined with Christ. Anything that we do that is an affront to God, which is sin, we are dragging Christ unwillingly into that with us. That is what he says. And that's not just for sexuality. That's for everything. When we just get become embittered to our spouse or we just get so mad on the road, if you're driving around Texas anywhere, probably not in Fairmount. Nobody really cuts anybody off out here. And you just get so angry with somebody, you just want to... <gasps> or do something so vulgar. So and you start beating the steering wheel and get mad. You're mad at your family, your kids, something at the house. Mad at a worker who's come over and done something. Mad at the electrical company, the power company, uh, the water company. All these things, just whatever the issue is. Christ is standing right there. I don't want to do this to that person. I don't want to say that to this person. I don't want to cut this person off. I don't want to go there. Don't make me go. Don't make me. I left it over there. I had my phone specifically for an illustration or a computer. Don't make me look at this stuff. Christ is within us screaming, don't make me look at this. Don't make me do this. We have no business involving ourselves in these things. We have absolutely no business involving Christ in these things. Any type of sinfulness. And that's what these people were doing. Verse 18 Flee, don't flirt. Flee, don't flirt. Verse 18. Flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. This is what we do, and we incur consequences. Simple concept. This is easy for one of the five uses of the body. Run like crazy. Run like a fool. Run like a madman. Do everything we can. And the perfect example of that was Joseph. Whenever he was in Potiphar's house and his wife came up to him and said, Lie with me. Sleep with me. No. He goes running out of the house. She tore off his cloak. Sadly, she used it against him. But he knew absolutely not and he said, Potiphar has given me authority over everything in the house. Everything is permissible, but he did not give me leave of his wife. 
not everything is acceptable. And not everything is good. Flee. Run like a madman. Run like Joseph from anything of sexual immorality in life. Get away as fast and as quick as you possibly can. If you need help and need a conversation because it's in, viewed in your mind, embedded in your mind, call me. I've got plenty of scripture. I've got plenty of resources to help, especially for men. I've done countless Bible studies for this. But the thing of the consequences that is speaking of here and incurs sin against the body is that we are taking a picture in our minds and it's being embedded and it will be there for the rest of your life. My wife is aware of my life and my disgusting nature before Christ. I've talked to her about it. And because of my stupidity, and my sinfulness and how horrific of a human being I was, that trash is in my mind. And I have to fight like crazy every day because of now the consequences that I'm being faced as a follower of Christ because of what I've put in my head. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, bear with me. I'm going to show some images on the screen. Trust your pastor. Just trust your pastor. Don't look at anything else. Just look up at the screen and we'll talk after it's over. Oh, there's pretty, pretty flowers. Oh, that's real pretty. These are real flowers. It's pretty. What do you think? Those are pretty, right? Beautiful arrangements. Mm. I'd like to have those in my garden. Those are really pretty. Yeah, absolutely. It's flowers. I'm sure, Sam, you're going to be making these for your wife in your in the garden at some point. Absolutely. It's real pretty flowers, too. That's really nice. <laughs> Go back to the flowers. Just try to, try to, don't think about that picture. Hmm. What color was the third flower? Could you tell me about one image that popped up there pretty easily? Why? Because that image of my lovely, fla lovely face was introduced outside of the pattern of the norm. There were pictures of flowers, and then all of a sudden you're introducing something that doesn't belong there? Do you not think that you're going to remember that picture here in a little while? This is what happens, and this is an example of why devices are so dangerous in culture. Haley has the passwords to my phone. She has the passwords to all my computers. She has the passwords for everything. She can go in and look at it anytime she wants. Not that I do anything that would cause her to desire that, but I'm an open book with her. She can look at whatever she wants. She has notes of gift ideas for me that she won't let me look at, but I, and we'll talk about how unfair that is. <laughs> But when we introduce something that does not belong in our lives, and that comes from images on TV, images in movies, images on our phones, we're imprinting stuff in our heads that's going to remain there for forever. And it'll be so easy to recall. Don't bore images into your mind, but rather keep the image of Christ before you at all times and in everything that you do. In verse 19... Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? That is really should, what should take up majority occupation in our person is the Holy Spirit. And if we're jamming all these rocks, cotton balls, water, dirt, and everything inside of a jar, it's going to fill up a different space. And then if I pour water into it, it's going to fill up the rest of the space. But then whenever I try to put something useful in there, Everything else has got to come out. The water's got to get out. The rocks, the junk, the nastiness, the trash has got to get out before I can fill it up with something good. If we are spending all of our time filling it with stuff of this world, there is not enough space for God's Holy Spirit. And do you not think, and we think, well, I'm feel, I have the Holy Spirit within me. Yes. Do you think it's possible? And you can look back at Ephesians and Philippians where it talks about 
the occupation of the Holy Spirit and how we can ask God for an extra portion more of his spirit, that means that there could possibly be less. Yes, the spirit dwells within us, but we are crowding the space in our person with everything else and not enough God. It is the temple of God, but I guarantee I could take everything out of this room and put a barnyard in here, and it's going to be filled up with something else other than what should be, which is God's people worshiping and praising. It's the same thing. So we, in verse 19, treat the temple right. Take care of this temple. Do better janitorial work. Clean out that stuff. Communicate, hey, I need this with spouse with a friend with a brother or sister in Christ with Jeff myself Don Haley one of your Sunday school teachers you have the ability as Sunday school teachers and we'll talk about this Thursday night if you're on a committee even if you're not a chairperson if you serve on a committee come to the meal cooking for you promise it's going to be good if you don't like what I eat bring you a sandwich But this, you as teachers have a good opportunity to communicate with your classmates and everyone that comes in there for Bible study to say, what is going on in your life? What do you need? What can I help you with? Excuse me. This is all committee. Bible study leaders next week. Again, good food. But verse 19 and 20 in closing. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify, your, glorify God in your body. Bring glory to God. Don't bring God to immorality. If Christ is within you, don't bring God into that junk of this world. <laughs> God has given us a spirit to live in us because Christ, because of Christ, and we no longer belong to this world. Why would we bring this world to him? This is going to be thrown away, just like the use of the body for food. It's going to be done with. We will no longer need that. You will no longer need that. We will fully understand the reliance and need for God. But don't wait. Practice that now. This, this word used here for being bought with a price, the core word is giving glory and then giving glory to God, is to give up a share of what is owed. If we were bought with a price, then we owe God something. We owe God us. We don't owe the world anything. The world owes God everything. So give God what is owed. Don't give him the smut, the trash of this world. We can't give him anything if our eyes are turned to sexual morality. Again, if there are difficulties, I'm here to minister. I'm here to love and encourage. That's all I do. That's all I want to do. And I'm going to fight like crazy on this earth to do that until the day that I'm called to be with him forever. Freed of sin, freed from all this junk in the world. But while I'm here, I will recognize that I'm bought and paid for. So are you. So we need to glorify God in our bodies. So as the ladies and Brother Steve come up, and we have this time of giving glory to God, use this time for that specifically. Just give God glory. Because he is deserving of what he has done for us. Let's pray. God, we love you and thank you again for all that you've blessed us with.